Good morning. Uh, welcome to Lunch with Books. Today's program is a review. I think it is. Okay. Uh, today's program is a review of Elvis and Gladys, The Genesis of the King by Elaine Dundee. Uh, our reviewer, Roy Turner, uh, as you know, he was the research assistant, assistant to Elaine Dundee throughout the process of writing the book. And so he brings unique insights to us about the author, the book, and Elvis. Uh, Roy is the executive director of the Elvis Presley Birthplace and Museum. He is very involved in the life of our community, having served or currently serving as a member of the Friends of Lee County Library, board member of the Tupelo Film Commission, volunteering with the Tupelo Elvis Festival, and overseeing the Elaine Dundee and Roy Turner Endowment for the Arts, which supports many of the artistic and cultural organizations throughout Lee County. Throughout the years, Roy has assisted a number of fellow Elvis historians in the development of their works in print and film, including the Arts and Entertainment Network's Elvis biography, Elvis Return to Tupelo, based on Roy's and Jim Palmer's documentary, Homecoming, Tupelo Welcomes Elvis. Thank you for being here with us to share. Please welcome Roy Turner. I think we're, I think we're good to go. I'm not going to do it and not mess it up. So when I go forward, it's that one. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. I see a lot of faces I haven't seen in a long time, and it's good to see you. You know, at the birthplace, uh, as you go in the front door, there's a sign that says, Elvis played here first. Well, for me, it all started here. I got my education at the Lee County Library because I only graduated high school. I, I went to college for a year to study computer programming, but you had to move to Timbuktu to find a job doing it. But, uh, and you could make more money loading trucks at Kruger, and that's what I chose to do instead of program computers. But I always had a thirst for things, and this is where I came to learn. And I used to tell people, because when I was young, everybody would come into the office. I looked, I think they carded me till I was 36 years old. In fact, when our first daughter was born and my mother-in-law got to the hospital and said, is Debbie Turner here? One of the nurses said, she the one that came in with her little brother? So that, that's just how baby-faced I looked. Uh, so people were always coming into the office at Sunshine and saying, are you in school, or where are you going to school? And I'd say, I, I graduated from the Lee County Library. So I love this place. Okay, this is gonna be hard for me. I don't talk loud enough. Started a long time ago. I'm 12 years old in that picture. As you all know, Elvis came back in 1956, and after that concert, gave the money to our mayor, and said, I noticed the house I was born in, and actually 13 acres at the time. We have 15 miles for sale. I want you to buy it and build a park for those kids of East Tupelo. He came back the following year, did another uh, concert, gave that check to the mayor, and said, I want you to build a youth center for those two, uh, those kids. I was one of those kids. And that's me in front of the sign at the Elvis Presley Youth Center in 1964. I had my first dance in what is now our museum. So I got a deep-rooted history uh, with old Elvis. I saw roots, as many of you probably did, in, I think it was 77, 76, thank you, Chico. And I came to the library, and I walked by the genealogy section, which was about as long as that table, and it was two shelves that just had a paltry splattering of books. And in my naive little dumb mind, I thought, you know, that would be fun. I can knock that out in a couple of weeks. You know, I'll order birth certificates, I'll order death certificates. And not knowing that was a lifelong pursuit. So by the time by the time Elaine Dundee got to Tupelo in 1981, I had been, 
I think, recording secretary for the Northeast Mississippi Historical and Genealogical Society. And when I was vice president, when I was president, when I edited the quarterly for TV, she won the Academy Award for a documentary she shot of the poet Robert Frost on President Kennedy's yacht. So I was in some high cotton with these folks. <laughs> That's Elaine and Ken on the wedding day. Uh, Kenneth Tynan, another claim to fame, he wrote the all-nude Broadway musical O Calcutta, if any of you remember when that came out in the 70s to like, I can't believe it. Uh, they were married for, I think, 14 years and it ended in divorce. And that was from an article in the uh, one of the London magazines back in their heyday. You can see they were kind of wild and avant-garde. That's at the bullfights in Spain. That photograph, by the way, was taken by the famous photographer Cartier-Bresson. Her first novel, The Dead Avocado, came out in 1958. It has never been out of print, and it's considered a modern classic. She followed that with uh, another novel, The Old Man and Me, and that was a play on words of Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea, and another novel, The Injured Party, and then a play, My Place. Then she changed horses and, and did a biography on the actor Peter Finch, and it was on the London bestseller list for several weeks. And her publishers came to her and said, we'd like for you to write a biography on the Beatles. And she said, nah, they don't interest me. But the story of Elvis and his mother does. And to tell it, I've got to go to the source of the Nile, and that's Tupelo, Mississippi. Now, two things she said that amazed me. One was, she would say, I didn't know Elvis was alive until he was dead. And then she'd clarify it by saying, you got to realize, I was wrapped up in the theater world. I was in England. Yeah, I'd heard about this guy, Elvis Presley, but I'd never heard his music, never seen his films, didn't see him on Ed Sullivan or any other places, you know, that he'd been exposed. So the day he dies, she gets in a cab, and of course, Elvis Music's playing on the radio, and she's just mesmerized by his voice, and she asks the cabbie, who is that? And he said, lady, it's Elvis, he died today, where have you been? So she goes into Harrods, and they're piping Elvis Music through the Muzak, and the more she hears, the more enthralled she becomes. So she goes to a, a record shop, and of all the records she could buy, she buys his gospel album. She's Jewish. So all of that was new to her ears. <clears throat> so her publishers, I think this is significant of her, um, evidently her prowess, or whatever you want to call it, as an author, because it's 1981. And when she tells her publishers she, she wants to write this book, and to do it she's got to go to Tupelo, Mississippi, they give her an $80,000 advance, which was quite a bit of money in 81. Her friends, uh, one of whom I got to meet and know, Rosemary Harris, and if you ever saw the first three Spider-Man movies, she played Spider-Man's aunt and did all of her own, own stunts while she was in her 70s in that film. Uh, but her friend said, and I'm going to be a little vulgar here, but I, I don't want to take away from the story. It's, what, it's the truth. Her friend said, don't go. They're heathens. You'll be raped 15 minutes after you get off the plane. And she came anyway. She arrived on a Friday, and Sunday morning she was sitting in Brother Frank Smith's little Assembly of God church listening to him preach just the way he preached when Elvis grew up. And that was her mission. She wanted to experience as many things that Elvis and Gladys had experienced as she could. And she used to, she's got a coin this little phrase, she said, Think of me in the, as the person in the old westerns. You know, there's always a stranger that comes to town in the old westerns. She says, I go as that stranger with a clean slate, and I just want to see what falls on it. And we stopped by my mother's one day on the way to a cemetery. My mother was shelling purple hole peas. And Elaine says, what are you doing? And my mother says, well, I'm shelling these peas, and we're going to cook them for supper. We're going to go back and have supper at my mother's house. And Elaine says, would Gladys have done that? And my mother said, you better believe it. So she says, may I? <laughs> and how many of you have ever shelled purple hole peas? <laughs> you know what it does. So she shells a few, and then she just laughs. She thinks it's so hilarious that it's turned her fingers purple. So it was this childlike quality that she jumped into the Elvis world. 
she also told me while she was here, she said, you know, I've always been around uh, very wealthy people and theatrical people. I've never been around ordinary people. And I find they lead the most extraordinary lives. And I think she was absolutely blown away with Southern hospitality. And uh, evidently a little bit with me. <laughs> we became lifelong friends. <coughs> One of her best friends was Gore Vidal, who I also got to meet. Never did like Gore Vidal, still don't like him. When I was a kid, um, and he would come on Johnny Carson, I would switch the channel to Dick Cavett. And when I finally met him, if I could have, I would have switched the channel. He was the most arrogant, self-absorbed, know-it-all I have ever met. But she absolutely loved him, and he loved her. And he and I shared the podium at her memorial service. And what he had to say was f far left. That's all I can say. <laughs> Another good friend was Gloria Vanderbilt. Uh, I think that card reads, Dear Elaine, um, thanks for wonderful letter. CBS Sunday morning show airing documentary on moi, oh God, November 7th, Channel 2, 9 a.m., love Gloria. I got to meet Gloria, only one time, but at Elaine's last birthday party, uh, the day before the birthday, she got this huge bouquet, and I think she was turning 84, and she was like a little giddy girl, because <laughs> all it said was, guess who's coming to dinner? And uh, she was like, who could it be? Was it, was it Gore? And I looked at the card and said, nah, this was sent from a florist such and such an area, he lives way over there, he would have used a florist in that part of LA, blah, blah, blah. So the next day at the party, this limousine pulls up, and Gloria Swan uh, Swanson, never met her, Gloria Vanderbilt pulled up, and she had flown in from New York just for Elaine's birthday party. And I got to chat with her briefly, and I think there's a picture. Well, I'm not in the picture because I'm always taking them. But, well, that's Gore, he was in a wheelchair at that time. Uh, this is Gloria on the right. So I tell her, hi, I'm Roy, Elaine's friend from Tupelo. And people kind of knew how I fitted into her life. They might not know the whole story, but she evidently knew enough. She said, oh, my late husband was from Law, Mississippi. I remember going to those family reunions and eating that good fried chicken and uh, fried okra. And I spent my time with Gloria... Vanderbilt talking about southern cooking, and I told her, I said, you know, we still cook like that. You can come down any time. With the exception of Gore, none of these people were pompous. They were just, I was so carried away with how simple and easy going and fun they were. The lady in the middle, Susan Don uh, Doniger, I think was the last name, just a little tidbit, her husband was the director. Remember the old Peyton Place television series? Well, her husband directed that series. And of course, that was Elaine. That was in August of 07, and she passed in May of 08. This drawing was done by an artist named uh, Don Bacardi. And I had met him at... Uh, the first birthday party, she threw herself a birthday party every year. And it was at, I never can remember, it's the Beverly Hilton or Beverly Wilshire. I just know it's the one that they filmed a pretty woman in. And it was an English high tea. And I didn't know what the heck to do. <laughs> and I sat between Dan Bacardi and uh, an author named Ann Edwards, who I had been reading since high school. And we be became and still are friends. Uh, one of her best books, if you, she did a lot of biography, one of the best ones she did was uh, Road to Terror, and it's The Life of Margaret Mitchell, and it's really good. Uh, but she did a lot of it. She did some real good ones on the Reagans, too, uh, and really nailed Nancy, but, uh, I mean, in a good way. But uh, Bacardi's... Uh, it was funny doing that. And by the way, I just watched Ann Edwards, and whatever tray she reached and got something off of, so did I. And I learned you worked your way up. And whatever she ordered to drink, so did I. So I had a glass of champagne. 
<laughs> which I don't even like champagne. Uh, <clears throat> but Don Bacardi, I don't know if he had a tick or what, but during the whole meal, whether he was eating or whether he was talking or whether he was listening, he constantly was in his chair doing this. And uh, I didn't know him from Adam's house cat. He didn't get to come the next year because uh, Angelina Jolie had uh, commissioned him to draw her. But I, 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 Elaine's birthday always coincided with Marilyn Monroe's death. I've always been a huge Marilyn Monroe fan. My eighth grade English teacher, Donna K. Randall, can attest for that. She let me do a report on Marilyn Monroe in eighth grade instead of George Washington. <laughs> And I was reminding her today that I got an A- because also in eighth grade, I learned the definition of plagiarism. <laughs> I didn't plagiarize the whole thing, but there was this one paragraph in photo play that said what I wanted to say so eloquently that I just copied it. <laughs> but uh, I lost my train of thought, Miss Randall. Oh, the birthday. The fans gather in L.A. for Melon's death the way the Elvis fans gather here. So I got to kill two birds with one shot. I'd get with them and we'd celebrate. And in fact, they asked me to speak at Melon's memorial service one year. Uh, and got a bunch of Melon tales I could share with you. But anyway, um, that year I had all us fans uh, before she moved out there, or maybe when she was out there, they would get together like kids at camp and just rent an entire hotel. And there was a little hotel right off Hollywood Boulevard called the Orchid, and we'd take it over that week. And to cut expense, you'd share it with people. And like the first time I went, I was sharing it with a bunch of strangers, and everybody thought it was crazy, and so many of those people had become lifelong friends. But I was sharing it with two gay guys that year. And I get back from the birthday party, and they want to know well, tell us about the party. And I'm telling them who's there. And then I mentioned Don Bacardi. Now, one of the guys, David, he was real, I guess, conservative and what have you. But Eric, he was just flamboyant and flaming. So uh, I say, well, Ann Edwards and uh, Hillary McKendrick and Don Bacardi. And they go, Don Bacardi, oh my God! You sat by Don Bacardi? And I said, yeah. I said, he did this the whole time. <laughs> well, come to he, the, so they tell me, he and his lover, Christopher Isherwood, are like the first gay couple. So I, I got educated in so many ways. Christopher Isherwood wrote a book called The Berlin Diaries, which became uh, Cabaret. And upon his death, Dan Bacardo established the Christopher Isherwood Foundation, and I feel pretty certain that's where Elaine got the idea to do the Elaine Dunn and Roy Turner. But anyway, that's kind of how I got my education. When Elaine came to Tupelo, Phyllis Harper did an article and made this photograph of her. That was my first introduction to her. And that's she and Phyllis actually in 87. And you can see how I've changed over the years. <laughs> and uh, when she left uh, at the end of the summer, uh, we had a little dinner at the Chinese restaurant out on East Main, and uh, Mayor Caldwell made her an honorary citizen. And she was so proud of that. She kept that on her mantle in her London house until she moved. And this was a party at the Fun Grove that we always read about in Phyllis's uh, columns. And of course, on the left is Brother Frank Smith and his wife, Corinne, who figured very vividly into Elvis's childhood, both in their own right with their own stories. And Corinne, thank God, was one of the few families that owned a camera in that little poor neighborhood in East Tupelo. And she had made pictures that she was able and willing to share with us. The lady on the far upper right <clears throat> is Gladys' sister Lillian. So when we're doing the book, Elaine had gone to Memphis that weekend, and in the process, I had found Elvis's third great-grandmother's grave over in Marion County, Alabama, and called to tell her that I had found it and that she was a Cherokee Indian named Morning Dove White. 
And I uh, also found another third or fourth great-grandmother was full-blooded Jewish. She said, that's the best news I've heard. I've had one no-show, one guy interviewed that I literally had to pull every word out of his mouth, and now I've got to call Aunt Lillian, and I just can't take another no. And I don't know why I said it, but I said, well, you want me to call her? And she said, well, what do you? Uh, so I did. Well, my father had worked. I didn't know any of this until we started this book. He had worked with Gladys in the garment plant that's now Relics Antiques while she was pregnant with Elvis, but she had also worked with Aunt Lillian. So when I called, I said, Miss Lillian, my name's Roy Turner, and you don't know me from Adam's house cat, but my dad used to work with, and she interrupted and says, Preston, prettiest black wavy hair on a man I ever did see. How in the world is he? And I brought her up to date, and she knew some of my other relatives, and then I told her what we wanted. And she said, yes, y'all come on up. And we spent many long afternoons in her apartment with her sharing stories we would have never known had she not been willing to do that. And plus, she was able to verify some of the things in the genealogy that I had circumstantial evidence, but not that concrete uh, document. And that worried me, because I was all about the documents. Uh, and she and I wound up becoming lifelong friends. And uh, one of the biggest regrets of my life, her daughter called and asked me to be a pallbearer at her funeral. And I had just been promoted to assistant plant manager at Sunshine. And in my dumb younger years, I just felt like I couldn't take a day off. And I will always regret that I didn't do that, because that was an honor. If, if they thought, of, if evidently she must have thought enough of me for them to ask, and then I didn't honor that. I hate that, but we do dumb things when we're young. Of course, uh, on that side is Becky Martin, who lived on the corner there at uh, Lake Street in Maine. Her father owned Roy Martin's grocery store, which the Presleys and everybody else in that community um, charged food at until they could pay for it. Becky told a funny story. Right after Elvis cuts, that's all right. Mama, this Cadillac pulls up in her yard, and she hears a horn toot, and she goes to the door, and it's Elvis. He says, hey, Becky, you want to go get a hamburger? She said, sure. So they go, I don't think it's Johnny's, because whoever it was, it had a jukebox. And I never remember Johnny's having a jukebox. But they get in there, and she said, Elvis sauntered over to the jukebox and dropped a quarter in, and presses, and it plays, that's all right, Mama. And they eat, and they get ready to leave, and Elvis says, could you pay for the meal? I put my last quarter in the jukebox. <laughs> <coughs> so she said about a month later, he pulled up again and tooted, and said, hey, you want to go get a burger? And she said, she told him, no, it cost me last time. But uh, he visited her several times. Uh, they were close. Uh, never like boyfriend or girlfriend or anything, just, just close. And on the lower be your right. That's Dr. Sterling, ha Dr. Ster Dr. Lester Hoffman's wife, Sterling. Dr. Uh, Hoffman was Elvis's dentist, and that was the last person outside of Graceland to see Elvis the day he died, because he went in the middle of the night to get his, uh, I think he had to have a cap replaced, uh, because he's going on tour the next morning. And Sterling met us and picked us up in her red Cadillac, 75 Cadillac, that Elvis had gifted her because Dr. Hoffman wouldn't take a gift from him, and he said, uh, well, you can't stop me from giving your wife a gift then. So he gave her the Cadillac. That is me and Elaine in uh, Faraday, Louisiana, where we were researching her second book called Faraday, Louisiana, which was about the three first cousins, Jerry Lee Lewis, Mickey Gilly, and Jenny Swaggart. And then at a book signing in the bookstore in the old Tupelo Mall. But uh, Faraday started out to be about those three cousins. And it became such an interesting town because when you enter Faraday, and it's probably the size of, it's probably smaller than, certainly smaller than Pontotoc, it's tiny. They have a billboard that says, Welcome to Faraday, we have produced more famous people than any other city in the United States. And among those three cousins, J. Lee Lewis, Jimmy Swaggart, and Mickey Gilly, then there was um, Howard K. Smith, who did the Nixon-Kennedy debates, uh, General Charles Chenault, who did the uh, Flying Eagle formation in World War II, 
uh, some famous basketball players. I, I'm not much into athletics. Uh, some blues singers. There was a place there called uh, Haynes Big House. And if Elvis had been in Faraday, that's where he would have been. Uh, and the most interesting person was uh, a blind, I think at the time she was 98 or 99 year old horticulturist whose front yard was covered in daylilies. And I forget how many varieties, would that be the word, of daylilies that she had invented with cross-pollination and whatnot. You meet some interesting people. Oh, but I have to tell you, during Fair Day put us in Jimmy Swaggart's church in Baton Rouge. This Sunday, he confessed to being caught with a prostitute. <laughs> An historic moment. We were supposed to go to his home for lunch. We went through a McDonald's drive through and this is Elaine standing right here reviewing that book uh, in the late 80s. And I think that's one of the last pictures that was made for the LA Times uh, within the last year of her life. And the photograph in the background is when she was about 30, and that's a, a Richard Avedon shot, who was a, a big uh, life photographer and later like one of the most preeminent photographers of his day. He did everybody that was famous. So that's all the pictures. So, Elvis and Gladys, uh, it was fun to research. And in doing it, I probably learned as much or more about myself than I did Elvis, because there were a lot of our backgrounds were similar. My parents moved from the country into Tupelo to go to work in the factories for a better way of life, just like Vernon and Gladys. Uh, my mother quit school in the 11th grade, my father in sixth, just like Vernon and Gladys. Uh, I had a, my oldest sister died when she was eight months old, and my mother and father always kept me tied to their coattail. There were a lot of things I couldn't do uh, because you might get killed. And Gladys, because uh, his twin Jesse had died at birth, she didn't keep him tied to the coattail nearly like my mother did, but there, there were still some, always some ropes attached. Um, at an early age, Elvis felt like he was his mother's protector. The good thing about doing this in 1981 is not only were Elvis's contemporaries still with us, but many of Gladys's contemporaries were still with us. And her contemporaries said after Vernon went to uh, prison at Parchman, Elvis would be in the room running around playing. He's three years old. And like a little cartoon character, he would just get to Gladys and put the brakes on. And he'd pat her on the knee and say, it's okay, Mama, I'll take care of you. And we all know he did till the day she died. My father was uh, at times an abusive alcoholic. And I can remember as early as five feeling like I was my mother's protector. I don't know. I just felt a connection, which I think helped in the research. Uh, I understood him. I understood a lot of the reasons and, and the way he was because of these similarities. I knew what it was like to be an East Tupelo kid and have people in Tupelo, kids, because it's kids that do it, not adults, look down their nose at you. So I knew the... Uh, the sneers and what have you that he had endured. Uh, he was made fun at, at Lawhorn. He was a, a happy kid. They wanted to hear him sing, everybody patting him on the back, encouraging him. He gets to Milam, and he's thrown in with those children from Tupelo, and he becomes kind of a joke. And plus, he starts going through that phase where you get pimples and the greasy hair, and, and of course, the hand me down raggedy clothes. And I know I, I went to um, the library, this one, and got the Tupelo High School annual for the year that would have been Elvis' senior year had he remained here, and started finding those people and interviewing them. One of them, Shirley uh, Goodman, uh, her mother was Shirley Lumpkin, and her father, Sam, he was lieutenant governor, and I, I knew there was this quote that Elvis said, Man, the last thing I remember in even Tupelo was a sign that said, vote for Sam Lumpkin for lieutenant governor. So when I asked Shirley what was Elvis like in school, she said, well, I'm just going to tell you the truth. 
If you wanted to make me mad, you'd write, Shirley loves Elvis on the board, and I'd find you, and he's going to fight. When I interviewed Janie uh, Kingsley, Lady McCaskill, who was in fifth grade with him, uh, she said, well, all I remember is I sat behind him in school, and he had the dirtiest ears any kid I ever saw. So, uh, and in spite of all that, Elvis loved and had the fondest memories of Tupelo and came back numerous times and, and did this. We wouldn't have this whole park today if it hadn't been for him thinking about the kids back then. Um, anyway, I did feel this connection, and I think that helped a lot in me understanding it and in explaining some of it to Elaine because this was really foreign country to her. Um, trying to think of some of the more interesting things that we discovered. Um, gosh, there were so many. I hadn't read this in 35 years. So yesterday I started thumbing through it and picking out past, and then this is her copy, and she's got all these little tabs, so I particularly wanted to read those. And I was blown away at the things that are in this book that's in this new Elvis movie that we uncovered for the first time in, well, it was finally published in 84. It was groundbreaking at the time it was published because so much of what we had had never been told about his life, his family, or anything. Um, every book since then has, you know, rehashed it. Uh, she really, her chapter in here on Colonel Tom Parker is called The Flying Dutchman. And she talks about him being an alien from Holland and uh, him putting the chickens on the hot plate. And if you saw the Elvis movie, uh, you saw all those events. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Of course, Lillian told us about Gladys' alcoholism in 1981. Lillian hated Vernon and the ground he walked on. He said, he killed my sister because he loved to chase women and drink and gamble. And he would uh, sneak vodka in, which was Gladys' drink of choice, and hide it from Elvis. Because if, uh, this is Lillian talking. Because if he could keep her drunk enough, he was free to do what he wanted. Elvis would come in from being on the road, because this is bef before Love Me Tender and all the films, find it, pour it out, raise Cain with Vernon, and as soon as he would hit the road again, he brought more vodka in. And she told us in 81 that she had died of uh, cirrhosis of the liver, they all felt like, but Vernon wouldn't allow them to do um, an autopsy. Of course, all that comes out in the movie, too. She also, uh, Lillian worked at Graceland answering fan mail until the, sometime in the early 60s, I think. And she said a lot of days at lunch, she'd just go to the kitchen there in Graceland to eat her lunch. And if Elvis was in town, he might happen to come in there and sit down and eat his lunch. And she said she could always read him, and she might say, son, what's troubling you? And he'd just spill his heart out to her. She said once Gladys died, she was never able to be that close to him again. Uh, the ones that were around him kept the ones they didn't want around him at bay. And she strongly felt that uh, had Gladys lived, Elvis' story would have been a different story. She was his anchor. Um, his beacon when he got too far out there, she had that power to reel him back in and get him back on track. Not that he wouldn't, you know, get off track again, but she would always be there. Uh, Vernon was, Vernon, most of you know about him, so I'm not going to say a whole lot about him. And in talking to Sam Bell, one of his childhood friends, when they lived at 1010 North Green Street, he told me lots of stories about Gladys. He said, that woman could make the best Kool-Aid. I don't know what she put in it, but it was better than any other woman's Kool-Aid. I didn't even know they drank Kool-Aid back then. Uh, he said, we never saw his dad much. He was never there. Of course, I know he, he worked in different areas. He worked at uh, Como, Mississippi, when they were building what they called at the time Jap Camp. It was never opened as such, but there was one built. Uh, some of the Presleys went to Pascagoula and worked in the shipyards for a while. 
But Bernie was out of the picture a lot, which made that bond between Elvis and his mother all that more. Um, it's funny how both his parents always talked about his dead brother Jesse in the present tense, never the past, and would say things like, you've got to live enough for two. And I think that put an undue burden on Elvis. And I know James Osborne, another childhood friend, whose brother was Mississippi Slim, who uh, Elvis idolized, a local singer on WLO radio, said that when they were going uh, from, from the little uh, neighborhood down there by the birthplace, they would cut through that property that's the park now, and if you'd go through those woods, you'd come out at Priceville Baptist Church, and then they'd cut through Priceville Cemetery to go to Tulip Creek. That was where they would play. And he said every time they went, Elvis would say, I need to stop by and see Jesse. And he would stop at the grave, and he, would, he said he'd stand there, it seemed like forever, because he was a kid. He said, probably not that long. Just stand there silent for a little bit and say, okay, let's go. So evidently, and, and Elaine did a lot of research on twins and twinship and bonds that were made in the room. I mean, she got deep into her research. And uh, uh, twins are just different from the rest of us. I don't know, are any of you here twins that could verify that? Are, are part of a twin? Who, who are you pointing at, Katie? Yeah. Emily's a twin. Um, I think uh, I think Elvis felt both triumphant that he survived and guilty that he survived, and that's a perfectly normal way for a sibling to feel over a situation like that. From studies and research that's been done. So the, I, I want to say this before I run out of time, because Jeff did mention the foundation. In 2001, Elaine said, uh, you know I'm getting older, and when I die, I want to set up a foundation in Tupelo, and this is the way she put it, to expose the little Elvises to the arts, and I want you to oversee it. And she passed in 2008, and I was executor of her estate, and was able to come back home and set up the Elaine Dundee and Roy Turner Endowment for the Arts through CREATE. We started with $600,000. It has now grown to over $1.1 million. And I get so much money every year to dole out to various organizations, and it has touched so many children's lives. Just because Elvis was born in Tupelo and a lady decided to come from London and write a book, I think that's a pretty remarkable thing. Uh, naturally, I helped support the Elvis Festival because, let's face it, if not for him, there wouldn't be an endowment. Uh, Tupelo Ballet, Civic Ballet, Tupelo Community Theater, Gumtree Art Museum, the guitars up and down Main Street. That was one of the first projects we did. It was a $20,000 two-year project, and every child in school from kindergarten through 12th grade participated, and we also taught a little brief Elvis curriculum uh, intertwined with their sociology classes and, and Mississippi history. My grandson was in kindergarten when they did it. And when he was about 10, he was living away from here with his dad, and he was spending a couple of weeks with us that summer. And we were driving through town, and out of the blue, he said, Papa, I painted a dot on one of those guitars. Well, I knew he went to Rankin, so we went and found Rankin's uh, guitar, and he looks and says, there's my dot right there. And I thought, yep, this program works. He will always have something vested. Um, I work with uh, Sean Brevard, and the wonderful program that she's a part of that brings an artist and resident in to work with the school children every year. We have had spoken word poets, sculptors, songwriters, African dancers, and I forget all the others. But one reason, I enjoy doing this for a number of reasons. One, I'm still a poor kid from East Tupelo. I would have never been able to have the funds to do this. And it's a joy to be able to do it. Uh, but I've told people, if all of the 
programs that are available to children now in Tupelo had been available when I was a kid, I probably would have spent 48 and a half years at Sunshine Mills, because y'all know secretly I wanted to be a Broadway singer. <laughs> Uh, they said I had a pretty good voice. I, I never thought it was that good, but I've also learned that, and I don't want you to take the wrong way, but that people that are good often don't think they're that good. Uh, just for the record, Elvis, in all those Vegas years, two things before every concert. One, he would kneel down and say a prayer. And two, before he'd go on stage, he'd turn to his guys and say, you think they'll still like me? After all those years, Marilyn Monroe, because I've studied her life a lot, every time before she went th before the camera, sometimes would get violently ill and throw up. Never thought she was any good. So maybe I was pretty good. Uh, I know I was good enough the Castellan Club gave me voice lessons with Dennis Bailey. <laughs> for I'd studied for two years, could have probably studied longer, but a little girl named Debbie came along and we got married. They went my Broadway blues. <laughs> so, um, if you have not read Elvis and Gladys, I urge you to because it went out of print. And I called uh, the University of Mississippi and said, have y'all ever looked at this book? No. I said, well, you should because it's not just the story of Elvis. It's the story of Mississippi Hill country people. So I said, send me a copy, and I did. And they brought it back into print. Gosh. Before her death, so it was maybe the early 2000s or mid-2000s, and, and they still keep it in print. Steve Yates at University Press said it, it'll always be in print as long as I'm alive. Um, but because it does, it, it talks about the people that settle this area and their customs and, and so many things. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. She's, she's a bit academic. I was telling uh, Ron back there, it's, it's, it's not written in the vein of your typical uh, actor or movie star biographies. It's, uh, at times, the reading can be a little tedious. But if you'll bear through the tedious parts, I think you'll really enjoy it. Now, I think I've ran out of stuff to say, Jeff. Anybody got any questions? I will say, Katie, will you stand? This is my youngest daughter, Katie. And uh, when she was born, we named her Catherine Elaine because I wanted to, and my wife agreed, I wanted to uh, kind of honor Elaine because she had dedicated this book to me. And then Elaine wanted to be Katie's godmother. And then Katie has put the final jewel in my Elvis crown and that she got married in March for the first time she'll be 37 you care for 10 year age in October finally got married and her husband's mother uh, was Elvis's third cousin and her husband had her, her, her husband had been married before and had two little girls that are three and five that are precious and I now have two little part Presley granddaughters <laughs> So from that dance in ninth grade, and he's still poking his nose in my business, but the best poke he did is when uh, Dick Guyton said, I'm, my health's declining and I need to retire. And I served on that board. And I said, do I need to resign because I'm in his job? <laughs> and uh, I, when I found out I got it, I retired from Sunshine and stayed retired for two weeks to go have fun every day uh, in my dream job. Getting to, it's just an experience. Uh, the people that come there, are basically, it's a pilgrimage for them. And to see their faces and their reactions, and to hear their stories, and to share my stories with them, it's so invigorating and rewarding. And I met some of the most interesting people. It's, you Tupelo folk, <laughs> I always say Tupelo has never appreciated Elvis for what he is or what he's done. To a great extent. It's gotten better. But I remember when we redid the uh, museum, I went with the Historical Society, which me and Mavis Crystal were real close. And 
she nicknamed it the Hysterical Society because some of their board meetings were done right hysterical. But uh, I went with them to tour the new museum. And we get through it, and one of the guys who I think the world of, he's gone now, but upon exiting, he says, I just don't get it. I don't see what all the people see in him. And I didn't even try to explain it. I thought, the man has touched so many lives the world over. And if you don't get it, there is absolutely nothing I can say that's going to get you to get it. But Tupelo is embracing and being proud of their native son a lot more than they used to. Because back uh, before his death, uh, I don't think there was a lot of respect for him. I can remember going when the fans first started coming from England after his death. I went to the post office one morning to get the mail. And this man and woman uh, were getting their mail from separate offices and having their little post office banter. And one of them said, did you see all those crazy Elvis fans in town? And I think we had like eight buses of Brits. And they had everything from piercings to tattoos to leather to you name it. Some of them. And some looked, looked average. Some of them tried to dress like Elvis. And uh, the, I think the guy said that. And they said, yes. And they were wanting to take pictures and have pictures made with people. And I was afraid they would ask me to have a picture made with them. I'm glad they're gone. And I just had to bite my tongue because I wanted to say, well, I hung out with those crazy tattooed people. I met someone from Argentina, uh, Portugal, the UK, and I broadened my horizons tremendously. And what did you do this weekend to broaden yours? That's what I wanted to say, but I didn't. Because I did broaden my horizons. I learned about other cultures. It helped me to learn that we're all people, skin us, and we're all just alike. Doesn't matter what color, what religion, what sex orientation, whatever. Skin us, and we're all alike. And we all want the same things. Uh, and I can thank uh, both Marilyn and Elvis and Elaine for that, because Elvis and Marilyn put me in groups of different cultures that I otherwise never would have been exposed to. The first time I went to LA for a Maryland gathering, I slept in bed with two strangers. One was a Wicca. I didn't even know what a Wicca was. That's a Maryland witch. <laughs> he was a perfectly fine guy. And the other one, Dorothy, she got up in the middle of the night. This is We were on the up and up, no hanky-panky. She got up in the middle of the night and yanked the cover off of us and said, if you have to go to the bathroom, you'll have to hold it. I'm sleeping in the bathtub and locking the door. I can't sleep for you two snoring. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I remember Elaine always said, uh, everybody's got something to bring to the table. Don't ever look down on somebody else or think you're better than somebody else because everybody's got something to bring to the table and you can learn something from everybody. And I really learned that from her because our culture here, at least when I was growing up, I think was very narrow-minded. Now, who's your daddy? Where's he work? And when do you go to school? Oh, you owe me as well. I'm Mississippi State. None of that crap matters. We've all got something to bring to the table. I've had fun. I hope you all have. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. He's everywhere. Absolutely. Uh, every, all of you remember Margaret uh, Carnathan, Margaret de Mobile. Well, I had interviewed her for my original documentary. Uh, and Barbara, you were in that interview and several others. <coughs> but she said uh, sometime after Elvis had died, she went to Tokyo on behalf of the city with some other city officials. And she was wearing a shirt that said Tupelo on it. And she said, this little Japanese boy, she said, I bet he was maybe 10, pointed and said, Elvis! He recognized the word Tupelo and made that connection. Absolutely. He's, the, he's definitely the best ambassador Tupelo ever had. We get sixty to 80,000 visitors a year at the birthplace of people that appreciate him. Uh, during the month of August, I told everybody, August at the birthplace is like 
Christmas for TJ Maxx. <laughs> We're just inundated with people and they're spending money like, like we do at Christmas. It's dead today and it was dead yesterday. But uh, lost that train of thought again. Uh, yeah, in a 13 day window this month, we had 35 buses from Denmark, Belgium, the UK, Portugal, then we had some independent, uh, Germany, uh, did I say Denmark? Yeah. And then uh, we've had some independent groups that weren't buses, maybe they came in a van, but they were together, from Switzerland, Italy, we've had some Native Americans. This is some, I'll give you some interesting demographics if I got just a minute. Uh, well, Tom Brown, who's a local Tupelo guy, y'all all know Tom, he does these conversations during Elvis week, and uh, he had me up Monday of last week to talk about the birthplace. And some demographics he was throwing out. Since this Elvis movie came out, Spotify, which is a music, something you listen to that I, I know nothing about, he said Elvis's music, since that movie came out uh, at the end of June, has been downloaded an increase of 56%. And of those 56% that downloaded it, it was like 51% were under the age of 30. So a whole new audience has just discovered him. Uh, let's go and think of another, st oh yeah. There were several things I never saw at the birthplace. One, I never saw locals. When the movie came out, or right before it came out, we were just swamped with local people wanting to buy t-shirts to wear to the Elvis movie. Most of our visitors were 40 and up. 40 up until there's been wheeled in a wheelchair. Since that film came out, the increase in young people, as, as young as 10, and I try to visit with as many of these people as I can, obviously I can't all of them, but I'll say, so you're, uh, I usually say, have we got a young Elvis fan? And if they're shy, whoever's brought them say, yes. And if they don't say, he just saw the movie, I always say, well, have y'all seen the movie? That's why we're here. We've seen it, and he or she's crazy over Elvis now. And the other thing is, rarely saw African Americans. Since that film came out, a tremendous bunch of African Americans coming to learn more about Elvis. So, yes, sir. As far as the Tupelo years, because that's really the era that I consider knowing something about, uh, it was spot on. From what I know from reading books and hearing other people talk, the rest of it was accurate. The chronology was not always right. Um, like one of, one of the things when the cops are uh, arresting him, which they never did, they threatened to. Uh, the little finger wiggle incident that happened in Jacksonville, Florida, and in the film they had it happen in somewhere else. But the stories were accurate. They just weren't necessarily in the right chronological order. And when I saw that trailer and saw the little boy go in that tent and get the Holy Ghost in that African-American tent, I knew it was going to be good. Because Sam Bell told me in 2005 when I first interviewed him about that very incident. Uh, Baz Luhrmann and, and Austin Butler came to the birthplace. Unfortunately, I was still at Sunshine, just on the board. Spent the whole day there. And our assistant director, Rhonda Lamb, said they went through multiple times, reading and rereading every word. And then uh, Baz Luhrmann went and was able to get Sam to his door and, and did about a 45 minute interview with him, which he posted on his, on Baz Luhrmann's uh, YouTube channel. So he really did the research. Now, for the Tupelo years, did y'all notice the courthouse in the background of Shake Rag? Yep. They, uh, Elvis never lived in Shake Rag, but that's okay. He lived on the hill. 
That was the two African American communities. Um, he didn't get kicked out of the birthplace and immediately moved to the hill. They left out a 10 year gap there, but I mean, he's getting kicked out at three and then they do that little comic book thing and he's this uh, 13 year old boy running around in shake rag. Uh, you know, after they got kicked out of the birth house, because when Vernon went to prison, Gladys couldn't keep up the payments. And even though Vernon's mother and daddy lived right next door and you'd think would take them in, for some reason they didn't. So they moved to South Tupelo in the mill town to live with her aunt and uncle. And they stayed with them until he got out of prison on Maple Street. That house is still standing. And then Vernon continues to live there with them for several months until he gets on his feet. And then he buys a house on Berry Street, back in the neighborhood across from the birthplace. Lives there for about a year, then sells the house to the elder in their church, Aaron Kennedy, who Elvis Aaron was named after. And he rents a house on Kelly Street. In fact, he rents two houses on Kelly Street. First one and then another. And when I was interviewing one of his neighbors on Kelly Street at the time and said, you know, what happened? I mean, he just sold that house. So it wasn't like they were broke. She said, he blew it. Gambling, drinking, chasing women. Then they move to Mulberry Alley. And most of you are of an age that you remember Mulberry Alley, don't you? It was on Main Street behind Long's Laundry and the fairgrounds, that alley was Mulberry Alley, and they lived in Mulberry Alley. Ernest Bowen's uh, father had a cabinet shop in that alley at the time, and he, he told me how his mother would send food to work with his dad to give to the Presleys. And then they moved from there, and of course that was close to Shake Rag, but it wasn't in Shake Rag, and to the best of my knowledge, Elvis never went to Shake Rag while he lived in Mulberry Alley. But then they moved to 1010 North Green Street, and Sam, uh, tell me an interesting story. <laughs> because I grew up an East Tupelo kid with that uh, perception, be it real or perceived, that Tupelo looked down on East Tupelo. <clears throat> Sam said the people on the hill in the African American community looked down on the people in Shake Rag. The people on the hill were either shop owners, a doctor, they had a doctor, a dentist, uh, the school principal, school teachers, more educated, shake rag was your domestics, your so-called yard boys, men that were porters on trains or worked in the cattle barn. So I think this class crap, it transcends all races. So <clears throat> it was on the hill that Elvis goes into that tent revival, but uh, another fella that Sam introduced me to, Bo Clanton, I can't think of his real first name, but everybody called him Bo, he drove a truck delivering groceries, and Elvis rode along in the truck to run the groceries to the door. And Bo said he carried Elvis into Shake Rag, and Elvis actually got to hear uh, and meet Muddy Waters among some of the other great old blues singers. Sam said when the blues singers came to town, they went to Shake Rag. They didn't come to the hill. They went to Shake Rag, because that's where they had women, whiskey, and gambling, and that was right up the bluesman's alley. It makes perfect sense. Yes, sir? The one thing that bothered me just because it wasn't accurate was they showed a scene that I thought was supposed to be a shake bag, and it looked like a Delta sheriff. Yeah, it did. It, it, yeah, the. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I agree with you there. His his idea of what Shake Rag looked like looked more like the Delta to me also. And if you ever want to see what Shake Rag looked like, you know the panoramic view of Tupelo after the tornado? I When I did the tornado documentary, I scanned that photograph into my computer at a real high resolution. And down in the right-hand corner, is a perfect aerial view of Shake Rag. I can see cows, I can see clothes on the line, and there were a lot of houses that, it's almost like Highland Circle, there was a common ground, like a little park, and they actually had block parties 
back in that day. And they'd roast a pig and everybody would come out and they'd celebrate. It was a very thriving community. And unfortunately, I know urban renewal was supposed to be a good thing, but it, it uprooted a lot of people and moved them from where their roots were. And they weren't happy about it. Uh, that money could have been better spent, in my opinion, to have tried to build houses back in Shake Rag if they weren't repairable than to put them in the projects. That's just my opinion, but the people from the Shake Rag, I think, feel the same way. But Sam Bell told me when I asked him about Shake Rag, he said, you can call it Shake Rag. I have to call it Cause Track. If I call it Shake Rag, I'll take a butt whipping. And then Sam's wife, Mary Jo, was from Shake Rag, so the hill boy had married a girl from Shake Rag. <laughs> Anything else? I think our time's up. <laughs>